It's a, a people, it's a community, it's a life, it's a heart, it's a spirit. Uh, parents of gay children say, I want my son, my gay son, to have the same opportunity to come to me and say, hey dad, I'm getting married, as my non-gay son or my non-gay daughter. The heck would you want a picture of a tattoo of a thousand dollars on your penis for? So you might just need to satisfy yourself sexually alone at that point. Do I regret it? Not one bit. Did I think that I would actually take it the next step and, and do it again? Uh, uh, you know. <laughs> and what goes into their life, how they handle it. There are 12 houses, and each one of those houses has a particular function. Look into yourself, think about it, and just be whoever it is that speaks to you. Hi, and welcome to Talking About. I'm your host, J.C. Alvarez, and we're very lucky to have Dr. Frank Spinelli with us today, acclaimed author. Right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, doc, should I call you Dr. or Frank or Dr. Dr. Spinelli? You can call me uh, Dr. Frank, how's that? <laughs> Dr. Frank. <laughs> My mother's watching. Oh, which, oh yeah. well, you know, that's, that's been, upset. well, you know, we don't want to upset mom <laughs> at all. Now, um, you've written this really fantastic book, which is, which is um, such a great, it's just hands-on instruction guide as far as like, questions that gay men don't usually tend to approach their doctors about and it's it's kind of like all right there thank you it's just, I'll tell you a secret when I was very young I went to my godparents house and they had this very cool son and he had a book called everything you wanted to know about sex but was afraid mm -hmm. to ask and I think I stole it and I read it and if you read my book the advocate's guide it's sort of that use that as a template because I think no matter how you you know, interpret information, it has to be given such a basic way, and that's how people learn, that's how I learn. So that's what I was hoping for. Well, that, and, and, and you know, it's, it's, we live in an age where, and we live in a community that sometimes there's questions that aren't asked and things that aren't approached, and, and you know, just asking the right questions just changes, changes everything. And, and what I'd like to talk about is um, the HIV virus, which we've now been living with for 25 years, and, and it's, it's changed a lot since its first conception, as far as like, you know, when we first... Oh, first certainly. Uh, you know, back in in the early 80s when we first had the epidemic and it hit its peak, mm -hmm. it was a death sentence. I mean, no right. one expected to live past that. And then with the development of AZT in the early 80s, we first had this hint of that we could control this virus or treat it but not cure it. And then certainly over the years, we've had so many changes in technology and different classes of drugs that, yes, I do think the, um, the virus itself hasn't changed, but the way we perceive it has changed. Right. But you have to remember that still, this year, there are over 1.2 million cases of uh, people living with HIV. Of that, a staggering 25% don't even know they have it. So we haven't really hit a point where we're, uh, we're getting people to get tested. We do have that World AIDS Day where we, where we ask people to get tested, but I still feel a lot of gay men in particular feel stigmatized by what it meant to have HIV and feeling that they were going to die or no one was going to accept them or that they were, their friends and family were going to be turned away and that you could catch it. So we still have a lot of work to do in the way we um, disseminate this information, especially to younger gay men, mm -hmm. because if you think about it, if you're in your 20s, you probably don't remember the early 80s when the epidemic was at its peak. Or you so think you're invulnerable, which is you know, the perception that a lot of young people have. It's like there's so many things out there that will protect me. Well, the, the, the interesting thing is that if you look at the statistics now, it shows that the increase is mainly in men who have sex with men under 30. Right. And, and those are the men we have to target now with education, and not so much fear of mm -hmm. dying, but the fear that, that this is a communicable disease and that we can control it and that you could probably live longer now with the treatment, but that, you know, I, I, still, I still get upset when, when somebody says to me, well, now you could just take one pill once a day and it, it's not so bad. It's still a disease that uh, really affects a lot of people's lives, and I don't think that anybody who has HIV would tell you, oh, I'm no worse for the wear. It doesn't bother me. And early detection is, is vital, which is... Early detection is very important. If you look at all the statistics, if we talk about T cells and viral load, mm -hmm. when, you, when you catch the, the virus early enough and you start treatment early enough, you have a better chance of living out a longer right. life as a healthier person as opposed to someone who's been debilitated. And now that we're seeing men in their 50s and beyond. I had a patient that was diagnosed at 73 this year, which was my oldest patient, and he didn't live very much longer after that. So the idea of catching it early, treating it early, and allowing them to live a, a full life. Now, as far as, um, 
how close are we? I mean, you, you've discussed um, treatments and, and so forth, but how close are we to sort of like finding a vaccine to the HIV virus? Well, it was very, th that was the most disheartening news that came out this year. Merck, who had the longest trial mm -hmm. for the vaccine, right. pulled the plug on their vaccine trial. And so now we're, we're left thinking that there isn't going to be a vaccine for the uh, unforeseeable future, which is very upsetting, not to protect people from getting HIV, but also all the information we would have learned from that vaccine and probably trying to find a cure. So it was very upsetting. And then also, I think another pharmaceutical company, Roche, is not going to invest any more money in future HIV treatment protocols. So it's, it's almost like everybody's squeezing their belt thinking, okay, how much money do we want to invest in HIV treatment right now? We do have a lot of drugs mm -hmm. available. There are even new classes that came out this year, which, are, which is amazing if you look at it from a you know, experimental or technological standpoint. Sure, sir, but still, we're no closer to a cure than I think we were 20 years ago, and that's really upsetting. And we see the devastation that's happening even outside the United States and South Africa, obviously, right. and then all the cases that we're seeing now in India and, and other countries. So the disease has become global, and that is a major healthcare concern. But the focus for me was to redirect it right back to gay men and say, look, don't forget about us, because if you go to a bookstore and you want to look up HIV, you're probably going to find something about South Africa. And I wanted us to remember the plague as it affected us gay men. Right. And you'll, you'll also discuss in the book, uh, not only do you discuss in extensive detail safe sex practices, which I think are very important, and continuing to play safe mm -hmm. in a very entertaining <laughs> way, but you also discuss um, PrEP and, and PEP, PEP. -E -P. Yeah. Well, PEP, or post-exposure prophylaxis, was a concept that had been uh, implemented in hospitals for a long time with hepatitis and, right. and whatnot. And it was an occupational thing. If you were working in a hospital, you got a needle stick. Sure. They gave you uh, HIV medication for one eight, 28 days so that you wouldn't contract the virus. There's a delay between being uh, in contamination with the virus and contracting the virus. Exactly. It could be up to 72 hours or beyond. So this idea was then implemented then in sexual practices. If if you had been raped, let's say, or you were in, uh, uh, you had a sexual interaction with someone and the condom broke, you'd go to your doctor and this protocol was instituted, which was very important, so that you could possibly prevent yourself con from contracting the disease. The interesting thing is now they're working on PrEP, which is pre-exposure, and the first time I heard, I was very nervous about what that might send as a signal to exactly, gay men yeah. saying, well, I'll just pop this pill and then I'll go have unsafe sex. Right. But um, now that we don't have a vaccine, this is something that we're probably going to have to address, especially for patients who have high-risk sexual practices. So it's just one of those avenues that we have to go down and we have to explore in dealing with this virus. Well, it's a great amount of information, and, and certainly I'm, we're really happy to have you here to touch on it because so many people really are so in the dark. So thank you for writing the book <laughs> and, and for getting the word out there. And uh, please stop by whenever you like and, well, and continue you. to grace us with your presence <laughs> and with your information. <laughs> And uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll see you again soon.